אל שדי, אל אל יונה אדוני. H to H is still the same, by the power of your name. אל שדי, אל שדי, אל קמקנה אדוני. We will praise and lift you high, אל שדי. of Abraham to the power of your hand turn the sea into dry land to the outcast on her knees you wear the God who really sees and by your might you set your children free El Shaddai El Shaddai power of your name El Shaddai El Shaddai El Kamkana Adonai We will praise and lift you high El Shaddai அன்பிதோ துதிப்பேன் அன்பிதோ மகிழ்வேன் 
Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we invite the blessed Holy Spirit, who is the living witness to the death and the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ on the cross at Calvary, to take complete charge of what we speak and what we hear and what we understand from the scriptures. We pray, O oh Father, that his presence will permeate the thoughts that are being presented to us by him. So as it moves into our hearts and minds through the preaching of the word, it will make a deep impression in our hearts. And Christ and he alone will be glorified. Blessed Holy Spirit, we honor you. We celebrate your presence. We adore your presence of being here with us at this moment, making us aware of what you saw and how everything transpired on that particular day so that we in our generation will be able to receive it into our spirits and our finite minds will not be a hindrance to hearing you speak to us what we need to hear. Thank you for everybody who is listening in to what I have brought today to present before your people on this Good Friday service 2023. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and Amen. Today I have a message to bring to you on this Good Friday 2023 which I have titled The Torn Veil. The Torn Veil. When you read Matthew's Gospel, we read about the painful trial of Jesus. Everything about the trial of Jesus was an injustice done to a very righteous man. Then not only was the trial a mockery of the true justice system, but we also see as part of the persecution being 
heaped upon Jesus. The Roman soldiers beat him mercilessly. And took him to a place of great pain and mockery, which was the place of the crucifixion, and put him on a cross. Having made him carry his own cross till that place, even though he was bleeding uncontrollably, his body was lacerated by the terrible whipping he received and he had to undergo so much of pain and agony. And on the cross, the Bible tells us, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 27, if you have your Bibles, I would like you to turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 27, and verse 46. The Bible says, and about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, it was at that very moment, almost every person is agreed who has studied the life of Jesus, that Jesus was made sin. He was made sin. All the sins of the world, past, present, future, was put on him. And the cry that went out of his lips was the agonizing cry of a sinner who feels forsaken and forlorn. Only in this case, this was not a sinner who was a sinner because of the sin nature in him. He was a righteous man on whom sin was placed so he may bear the sins of this world. It's a vast difference. The difference lies in the fact that we are sinners because we have the nature of sin in us. We are descendants of the first man, Adam. And so when we are born into this world, we are born with the nature of Adam, the Adamic nature, the sin nature. But not Jesus. Jesus' birth was supernatural. And so when he was born into this world, he did not come into this world with Adamic nature. He had the nature of God in him. He was the son of God, the only begotten of the Father. And on the cross at Calvary, we see this agonizing cry go out from his lips. Significant because it identified him with every sinner, past, present, and future. And not only that, the Bible tells us God dealt with the sin issue once and for all by the price that Jesus paid on the cross at Calvary. He gave his life on the cross, shed his blood, God's anger against sin was dealt with, and today the sin problem has been removed. So what the sinner has is only a sinner problem. A sinner problem meaning he is living in ignorance of what Christ has done. He must be told about what Christ has done. So he can understand that God is not holding it against him for the sin. Because the sin has been dealt with. No more is sin an issue in the mind of God. The payment or the penalty of sin which was death, has been paid for through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross at Calvary. Now, having said that, soon after this agonizing cry that goes up, which was, of course, misinterpreted, and people thought he was calling for Elijah to come and strengthen him, the Bible says in verses 50 onwards that Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost and behold the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom or torn from the top to the bottom and the earth did quake 
and the rocks rent and the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints which slept arose came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many now briefly i want to stop there because i have one more verse to read but i just want to stop there so that uh, we will just concentrate on the title of this message which is the tone veil god willing i'd like to speak to you about this tone veil not only for this good friday service but also on easter sunday i would like to share with you a continuation of this message so that it will be a blessing to us to have the whole message and how it relates to us as christian believers now many things happened the moment christ died the bible says the first thing that took place was that the veil of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom from the standpoint of god's great redemption plan for humanity this was one of the most important moments that ever transpired in all of history the tearing of the veil did not just occur as a one off incident in fact it was an event that began from the time we see the history of man and how his fall triggered some very specific events that took place in the garden of eden when you read in genesis chapter 3 the bible tells us that something took place after the fall of man the first thing was man lost his identity of being someone who could enter into the presence of god without fear without anxiety without guilt and without condemnation he lost it all now all the things that was alien to him grabbed a hold of him he became fearful he began to fear the presence of god when he heard the voice of god no more would he run towards that voice he began to run and hide from that voice he also began to understand that he was naked and shame and so many things that he had never experienced earlier started to manifest themselves in full measure and form the moment he sinned so much so you see him and his wife in desperation eve making for themselves fig leaf aprons nobody taught them to stitch nobody taught them what to do they immediately began to earn a way in which they would find a covering for themselves and in the process appear clothed before the voice of god it's very sad to see what was happening in the garden of eden but it is also a picture of what we see will transpire in the end times when we see the picture of new jerusalem in the book of revelation and what we understand by this one act of this veil being torn from the top to the bottom hinges on one word it is the word access access to god and the presence of god was hindered because of sin that's why we need grace 
And when you talk about grace, grace actually literally means we have access to the grace that God gives us, which is unmerited favor. At the same time, there is also access to the giver of grace. These are two things that we need to pay attention to. One is access to grace. The other is access to the giver of grace. Now both those elements were hindered in the Garden of Eden because of sin. That's the reason why we need to understand this as an example. Suppose we had a problem in our life, a need, which was so great. And there's only one person who can handle that need. And that person is super able to handle that need with no problem at all. What would be our heart's desire is that we may have access to that person, access to that individual. In all probability, if we look at it in an earthly way, access is always hard to come by when we have such a person who has the power to help a lot of people, who is very wealthy, who is very influential, by certain barricades that are placed before that individual. So what we as people who are longing for some kind of a help, our craving is to somehow find access to the one whom, from whom we can get this help. Now suppose that person was to meet us and tell us, listen, don't forget, forget about my secretaries, forget about my uh, bodyguards and everyone who are by my side. You have access to me at any time. You can come at any time. Come and meet me. I'll help you. It would be good wisdom and make good decision taking and sensible decision taking for a person like that to make use of the access which has been made available to him to meet such an individual. Now, it would be foolish not to accept the offer. It would be foolish to turn the offer down. It would be foolish to try to make yourself worthy of the offer first, especially when, in fact, you could never make yourself worthy of it. Now, all these things must be well understood for us to understand the power of what happened when the veil was torn. But before I come to that, I want to share with you about the example I'm giving you. It would be the best thing to accept the offer by faith and to take full advantage of the access given to us. The torn veil provided that access for us with God. Now the access has been made available. We are asked to come boldly with confidence before the throne of grace, not with fear and trembling, not with a guilt conscience, not with condemnation in our hearts. We can come boldly. And we are welcome to come to him for everything that we need. That's why it's very important for us to understand that Jesus completely paid the death penalty on our behalf. And now the way has been opened up to the Father through this, this open act of God that took place on that fateful day when Jesus gave up his spirit and died. Remember, Jesus' atoning death on the cross has torn the veil in two and has now opened up complete access to the throne of grace. It is one of the most remarkable things to have ever happened in all of human history. Now, first we need to understand what was the veil that was torn. Why would something be torn in the temple when all attention was focused on Jesus who was being crucified 
in the middle of two thieves. Remember, Jesus was not just an ordinary criminal. All of Jerusalem were moved by the things he spoke. His death that day was a very grand event. It was not some quiet event. Everybody was following what was happening on that day. So the, the significance of his death while he died on the cross at Calvary is connected by the Holy Spirit to an event that was taking place inside the temple. A distance of so many yards away. And what was happening was something very, very different. Now, the first thing I want you to know was why, what was this veil that was stoned? The veil was an important part in the long story of God's plan to restore a relationship back with him, which fallen man had lost in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve had invented this barrier. The barrier had come up because of sin. And because every one of us who were born from their unity or union, they were united in the way they sinned, then later they would bring forth natural descendants. You find that every one of us bore in us the nature of Adam and Eve. That's why Adam and Eve were chased out of the Garden of Eden. They were actually literally driven out of the Garden of Eden. Not only were they driven out, they were coming out with a curse on them. The curse was a very heavy yoke that they had to carry with them. And to engineer the plan of God of salvation, God had to look for a man who would come into covenant with him. And such a man he found who was called Abraham. So through the descendants of Abraham, God would somehow begin this plan of salvation and redemption as he would deal with the descendants of Abraham when he brought them out of Egypt. And he commanded Moses to establish a place where he would dwell in the midst of God's people in a visible form. An invisible God would dwell in the midst of Israel in a visible form. How would he be visible? He would dwell in a tent that would be called the tabernacle because it would represent God dwelling amongst his people. He would be tabernacling in the midst of his people. The position of the tabernacle would be that it would be central to the life of Israel and the Israelites. The 12 tribes would be encamped around the tabernacle. So much so that if somebody had a bird's eye view of the camp from on top, the way in which the position of the tents and the tabernacle would represent the picture of a cross. There would be three tents to the north, three tents to the south, three tents pitched to the east, three tents pitched to the west, and in the midst of it would be the tabernacle. Now, in Exodus chapter 26, please turn with me in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 26. We're going to read a couple of verses from verse 31 to verse 35. Exodus chapter 26, verse 31 to 35. Exodus chapter 26, verses 31 to 35. It says here, You shall make a veil woven of blue, purple, 
and scarlet thread and fine woven linen. It shall be woven with an artistic design of a cherubim. You shall hang it upon the four pillars of acacia wood overlaid with gold. Their hook shall be gold upon four sockets of silver. And you shall hang the veil from the clasps. Then you shall bring the ark of the testimony. Now that's the ark of the covenant. The literal representation of God's holy presence in the midst of the people of God. It was believed and it was confirmed in some of the instances that we read in the scriptures that the presence of God was visibly seen at times hovering over the Ark of the Testament or the Ark of the Covenant. Now, the Ark of the Covenant had to be brought in there behind the veil. The veil shall be a divider for you between the holy place and the most holy place. You shall put the mercy seat upon the Ark of the Testament in the most holy. You shall set the table outside the veil and the lampstand across from the table on the side of the tabernacle towards the south and you shall put the table on the north side. Now, this tabernacle was a tent-like structure which had a large outer coat. But inside, the coat was the small tent-like structure which had two compartments. One was called the holy place, the other was called the most holy place. And there was certain furniture that was expected to be found in the holy place. But in the most holy place, it was necessary, God said, for the Ark of the Covenant to be housed there. Because the most holy place represented the place where God abode, God dwelt, and the place where God operated from. So you can imagine that entire structure was a structure that struck the Israelites with awe. Because they knew inside the tent, when the high priest went in or when the Levites ministered, apart from those who were flesh and blood, there was a living God, all-knowing, all-powerful, all-sufficient, whose presence was there in the most holy place. So it was a very awe-inspiring place for almost all the Israelites, especially because they knew that the most holy place was not a place that anyone could enter into. In fact, the book of Hebrews calls it the holiest of all. In the, in the book of Exodus, it is called the most holy place. Now, the Bible says, the veil that we are reading in Matthew's Gospel was the veil that separated this holy place from the most holy place. In the time of Solomon, the temple was erected, so we're talking about a temple that was, you know, there in Jesus' day, which had all the exact features of the tabernacle but only thing built in a much grander and more splendid way because of what Solomon had done in his lifetime. Now, this veil was necessary because of sin. I want you to make a note of that. Sometimes people wonder why is this, why was this veil necessary? This veil was a warning that sinful fallen mankind had to be separated from the presence of a holy God. That means nobody could just walk into the presence of God and come out just like that. If you went into the presence of God, you had to enter into the presence of God in his terms, on his terms, his way. Or else, the guardian cherubims who were there would smite you dead. That's why the 
whale had a picture of the cherubims woven into it. It was a warning to men. The cherubims were guarding the presence of God. And in another sense, it was as though the whale had a word written on it. Access denied. So every time people came up to that whale, they will know this is the place where we can go. Maxim. We can't cross this place. We can't go beyond this place. There's only one person who can do it. And he will do it only on the day of atonement. The high priest. Even the high priest, there's so many procedures before he could do it. But first thing he had to do was, he had to make an atonement for his sin, as well as the sins of the Israelites, which they had committed in ignorance. I want you to please... Read this portion of scripture along with me to understand the implications of what I'm talking to you about. Hebrews chapter 9, please. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 6 and 10, or 6 to 10. Now, when these things had been thus prepared, the priests also went into the first part of the tabernacle, performing the services. But in the second part, the second part is the most holy place, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and, the, and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit indicating that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. That means as long as the first tabernacle was standing, as long as the temple was standing, this veil was a warning by the Holy Spirit, man does not have access into the presence of a holy God. Temporary access is given only to one man. And only that one man can enter in. And the Bible says it was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience. That means every one of the high priests in the past who had operated as a high priest on the Day of Atonement knew fully well that all the sacrifices, everything they did could only temporarily give them access into the presence of God. Why? Because their conscience had not yet been cleansed, washed, sanctified, so that they could stand before God with a clear conscience. That's why the Bible says, which cannot make him who perform the service perfect in regard to the conscience, concerned only with foods and drinks, various washings, and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of reformation. So, the veil was a significant part of God's holy tabernacle. And although it highlighted the separation of a holy God from a sinful man, it was also a picture of grace. How was it a picture of grace? Because on the day of atonement, God still permitted one man, the high priest of Israel, to pass through into his presence to offer blood for the atonement for himself and of God's people that had been committed or sins that had been committed because of ignorance. Now, all this took place every year. The Day of Atonement was a yearly event. It had to be performed. It had to be adhered to. Why? Because the blood of the bulls and of goats were not sufficient to be a sacrifice that could give man complete and full access to God all the time. Now, before we 
go a little bit further. I want to share with you about what happened to one particular priest when he had gone into the holy place. It's very significant because when you understand the significance of what I'm telling you, you'll understand why the tone veil meant a lot, not only to God, but to every one of us as well. The man's name was Zechariah. The Bible tells us in the New Testament in Luke's Gospel, Zechariah went into the holy place to offer incense. And as he was offering incense, the angel Gabriel appeared to him. And I want you to see it so we can read it and together understand what an amazing event that must have been for Zechariah. Luke's Gospel, chapter 1. You can write that down, Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, and we are going to read from verse 5 onwards. There were in the days of Herod the king of Judea a certain priest named Zechariah of the coast of Abia, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. If you have a highlighter in your hand, I want you to make a note of it. Still, this couple who were blameless, who were righteous, had one problem. They had no child. And they had no child because that Elizabeth was barren. And they were both now well stricken in years. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. Now, burning incense was instituted during the time in which the tabernacle was first built in the wilderness. God had specifically uh, given instruction about what the incense would be like and he had also made a very direct insistence to Moses that it had to be burnt twice a day in the morning and in the evening. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. Incense has always represented prayer. And because of that, it was significant that the Bible tells us that while he was offering incense, all the people were praying. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zechariah, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son. And thou shalt call his name John, and thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. Now verse 17, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. This is the call that was placed on John's life. Now, having said that, he would not only really turn the hearts of people back to God, he would be the one who would make an announcement about the person who would be the Lamb of God. You have to make note of this because John was of the priestly tribe of Levi. And it was his priestly job to announce Jesus as the Lamb of God. 
Remember, we don't see John doing it inside the temple prisons. Even though he was the son of Zechariah and Elizabeth, John is not seen ministering inside the temple. He was following the leading of the Holy Spirit. He was standing at the Jordan, baptizing people, speaking about repentance. And that's when he, see G he sees Jesus and he says, Behold the Lamb of God. It's amazing that the Lamb of God would come not from the tribe of Levi, but from the tribe of Judah. And the announcement would be specifically designed by God to be made by a priest, a Levite priest. John was a Levite priest. Often people don't realize that John was a Levite from the tribe of Levi. In fact, his mother was a direct descendant of Aaron. That means the Aaronic priesthood was on John. Because we know of John as the Baptist, or the one who was baptizing at the River Jordan, we don't relate John's lineage to being that from the tribe of Levi. But it's amazing that all this took place inside the holy place. Just before the veil and the angel Gabriel tells Zechariah, Zechariah the son you are going to have is going to turn the hearts of many people to God he's going to bring them back to God but you must understand one thing he's also going to be the forerunner of the Messiah he will be the one who will announce who is the Messiah. So, the question about what was the veil is now very clear before us. It was a reminder of sin. It was also a reminder of the necessity for grace. Number two, when and how was it torn? The Bible tells us in verse 15, we are told that the moment Jesus lifted up his voice and cried with a loud voice and gave up his spirit, the tearing of the veil that separated sinful humanity from a holy God was torn from the top to the bottom. The tearing of the veil was a God act. It was torn from the top to the bottom. It must have been a very terrible sight because while you see Jesus hanging on the cross there crying out with a loud voice in the temple the priests who were ministering there during the evening sacrifice were screaming out in horror because something that was unthinkable had happened the veil that separated the holy place from the most holy place was stone. Now they could see into the place where for centuries they had only heard what was inside. They had not seen what was inside. Only the high priest knew what was inside. Must have been a very terribly frightening time for those people in the temple. But the event was not meant to terrorize the event was meant to be a significant sign to men. Access to God has been opened up. What a blessing it is this Good Friday to hear these words. Access is not denied any longer. Access to God has been opened up. Hallelujah. We're going to read a portion of scripture and close in continuation of this I'll take it during the Easter Sunday service I want you to turn with me please to Hebrews chapter 6 Hebrews chapter 6 verses 17 to 20 we'll read those verses in close thus God determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, 
we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay a hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Jesus was of a higher priestly order than the priestly order of Levi. Just like Melchizedek of old, who met Abraham after he had won the victorious battle against the kings. The Bible tells us, Jesus entered the holiest of holies with his own blood. He was not like the high priest of old who had to first offer sacrifice of blood for himself. Because he had never sinned. As our high priest, he entered the holiest of holies. And he has provided a full atonement for us in his own sinless person. Not a partial atonement. It is a full atonement. So much so, what he did for us, no other earthly sacrifice can ever measure up to it. Therefore, as we read in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 20, he has opened for us up a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. What a cause of rejoicing it must be for us today that the veil has been torn, that access to God is complete. I don't have to fear any longer. I can come before God with confidence. Today, if you're just a person who has never heard about the power of the torn veil and what it signifies, it's time for you to understand that you don't have to fear God any longer. You can come to him in humility, trusting in the finished work of Calvary and say, Blessed Father, I open up my heart to you and I accept the Lordship of Jesus into my life. I want him to be Lord of my life. I want to be free from all unrighteousness. I want to have my life washed and cleansed under the precious blood of Jesus. I want to no longer live a life where I always have this hindrance when it comes to praying, when it comes to declaring my faith in you, when it comes to uh, talking about you. I don't want this veil, this sin to stand in my way any longer. Knowing fully well that access to you has been opened up from your end to me. Remember, it was not opened up from man's end to God. It was opened up from God's end to man. That's why the veil was torn from top to bottom. It wasn't torn from bottom to top. If it had been torn from bottom to top, because it was a huge veil. The actual dimensions of the veil in the temple were unbelievable. No human being could have torn it with bare hands. That's why it was a horrif horrifying sight for the priests in the temple. I once read that the thickness of the veil itself was about four inches thick. It's impossible for some man to have torn it with his physical hands. God did it. And he did it in one action. The veil in the temple was torn in two. It was not torn in three or four bits. So you must understand it was God opening up the access to him once again. No more is sin standing as a hindrance. Now God says, all that is over. Come to me. Come. Boldly. And stand before me. Through the blood of Jesus. Through the work of Calvary. Because access has been opened up to you. Let's bow our heads in prayer, please. And we'll continue seeing the implications of the tone veil in our next message that I'll bring to you on Easter Sunday. Let's pray. 
Father in Jesus mighty name we thank you for this beautiful day thank you for the word we have heard and the words that we have read from the scriptures we are grateful that the torn veil means a lot to us as Christian believers because we understand that access to the giver of grace and access to grace has been opened up completely fully not in a partial way through the one who has entered for us into the veil our forerunner the Lord Jesus Christ whose work at Calvary is a complete work father we thank you for his blood has paid the price and today we stand before you with grateful hearts we know that without you we can do nothing it is your mercy that has brought us again together to remember what transpired that fateful day when Jesus cried out loudly and gave up his spirit father we thank you because the moment he did it the moment he left this world and entered into the veil of your presence with his blood his work was accepted oh hallelujah hallelujah it was not meant to terrify it was not meant to scare people although people who never understood it were terrified and scared and in ignorance they were not able to discern what was happening but today we understand oh mighty father how merciful you are in tearing the veil and permitting man to once again come into your presence we give you all thanks and praise let the day continue to be a day of blessing let many hearts be turned back to you and lives be committed into your hands may people who have let the veil continue to remain understand the veil has been torn the veil is no longer there and all that they need to do is accept the work of Calvary accept the work of Jesus and to humble themselves and move into your presence O oh father we give you all thanks and praise great is thy faithfulness in Jesus' precious name we pray and everybody said amen and amen and may the blessing of God the father the blessing of God the son and the blessing of God the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each one of us both now and until Jesus comes again பிதாவாகிய தேவனின் அன்பும் தூய பரிசுத்த ஆவியானுடைய ஐக்கியமும் நம்மோடு கூட இன்றும் என்றும் இருப்பதாக ஆமேன் அண்ட் ஆமேன் ஹல லூவியா ஹல லூவியா வாட் அ ஜாய் இட் இஸ் டு பிரிங் டு யூ திஸ் வேர்ட் கிரேட் அ ஜாய் இட் இஸ் டு மீ டு பி ஏபிள் டு ஷேர் த குட் நியூஸ் தட் ஆக்சஸ் இஸ் நோ மோர் டினைட் த வேல் இன் த டெம்பிள் ஹஸ் பீன் டோன் இன் டூ God has given us the greatest sign visible sign from heaven in an earthly manner and it was recorded for us hallelujah glory to god we can now come into the presence of god through the blood of jesus christ without fear condemnation or guilt god bless you all do share this message with someone else and although this may be a word that you would have understood some time ago when you accepted Christ into your life personally remember there are still many who don't know that God is not against them he is not holding it against them he is forgiven their sins they need to know about his forgiveness that's the word of reconciliation that the bible tells us has been given to us that's why we read from second corinthians I'd like to read that verse to you as a word of exhortation in 2 Corinthians the bible says in verse 18 chapter 5 verse 18 and all things that are of god who had reconciled us to himself by jesus christ and had given to us the ministry of reconciliation to wit that god was in christ reconciling the world unto himself not imputing their trespasses unto them and it committed unto us the word of reconciliation it is for us to tell others god is not imputing sin to you 
he is not crediting sin to you. He is wanting to credit his righteousness to you. Why not accept? Why not take this offer that he is offering as one of the greatest blessings of all that will not only ensure that you will have joy on earth, but your eternal destiny will be sealed forever. You can be a person who can go and live your eternity with this God who has given you his righteousness. God bless you all to share this teaching link with someone else and let this word go forth to be a blessing. God bless you. ஆத்மநேசரி உம்மை ஆராதிக்கின்றி நீரேந்தன் அடைக்கலம் நீரேந்தன் கோட்டையுமே கேடகமும் மான்கள் நீரோடி வாஞ்சிப்பது போல் என் ஆத்தும வாஞ்சி குதி ஆத்தும வாஞ்சி குதி Make sure you don't miss receiving our free monthly newsletter The Pulpit which contains a four part teaching series on various bible topics that will help you live in victory. You can read it online by going to christchapel.in and click on ebook library where you will find all our newsletters available. To receive a physical copy of Pulpit you can go to christchapel.in and click on join now. and fill in your complete postal mailing address along with your contact mobile number and we will be happy to send it to you free and postpaid should you want to receive the newsletter via email do include your request along with your current email id thank you and god bless